if you're a publisher and you have a website, um, uh, what should be the key performance indicators that you should be tracking? Um, and uh, where I'm going to draw this um, um, recommendation, shall we say, or at least a set of things for you to think about, um, is uh, three years of classes that I've run at Medill, um, uh, uh, a class that I uh, co-created with um, an expert in networks at Northwestern. Um, uh, that uh, uh, in which I uh, uh, take our undergraduate students, actually we also have a version for the grad program, the MSJ program, um, and I ask them to look at websites, publishing content websites, um, and um, evaluate how well they are doing in what I call networked audience development practices. Um, and the premise here is that um, the web, the way audiences aggregate online is different than we're used to in traditional media. In traditional media, you know, the way audiences aggregate is you get someone to subscribe and drop the newspaper on your front doorstep. Um, uh, and um, uh, you, but sort of that act of subscribing and getting it delivered to you becomes um, to some extent habit forming, we hope. Um, uh, and um, you kind of go back to that, that product, that media product over and over again. That's the goal, certainly historically. On the web, though, traffic aggregates in different ways. Um, people click on links from other sites. People go to search and search for things. Um, people um, uh, consume content that is referred to them through social media channels. And so all of these, and this, you know, I'm not, I don't have time to take you through that entire course today, uh, but the premise here is um, if you understand how networks work, um, you actually might be more successful in building a, an audience on the web. And, and I would argue the same things increase, will be true about, dig, about mobile um, uh, products as well. Um, in this class, um, I have them uh, basically, uh, and by the way, I, uh, in terms of your thinking, uh, and for the future, the next time I teach, every time I do this class, I'm looking for publishers, typically locally focused publishers, who have websites um, uh, and have Google Analytics installed on those sites, um, who are interested in having a couple of my students do this evaluation for them. So um, if this is something you might be interested in, um, please talk to me afterward or shoot me an email because I think the next time I'll be teaching this is almost, it's almost a year away. But um, if you might be interested in that, um, I'd certainly be interested in having your site be one of the ones that we look at. Um, as I said, um, the process of doing this is kind of interesting. The last class that I just finished in the spring, uh, and then excuse me, in, in March, I guess we finished this, um, uh, we had 10 locally focused websites from all over the country. All of them, all of, most of them, nine of the 10, were pure play um, digital sites. Uh, one was a website associated with a magazine in the local market in Texas. Um, previous versions of the class, I've had local newspapers. I actually had the um, Northwest Herald in the class uh, a couple years ago um, as one of the sites we looked at as one example. Um, and what's interesting is that basically I, I introduce them to Google, Google Analytics. I show them how to extract some meaning from Google Analytics. And then actually we, in the class at least, we don't publicize this outside, but we actually end up with access to, in the spring, 10 different sites Google Analytics data. Um, and we can start looking at how they compare to one another. Um, and what you see is that the performance by various metrics starts to, it, it, it's different. <laughs> you know, um, some sites do better than others on certain measures. So that gives us really kind of an interesting window into who's doing things right and who could learn from other people. Um, and uh, in the process, we end up, the students end up writing a report, typically 20, 30 pages, that goes to the site that says, here's what we observe in your analytics data, here's what we recommend that you should be doing differently. Um, and uh, from that, actually, I feel like I've gotten a really good dive into a fairly wide variety of different sites, how they're doing in building traffic through what I call these network audience approaches. And um, essentially, what I'm going to sort of spit back out at you is some things that I think we've learned that are interesting um, in terms of uh, different metrics that seem to be telling um, in how well a site is doing in building its, its audience online. Um, I add this last bullet to say this is a work in progress. It's a work in progress because, um, first of all, I actually haven't tested this in front of an audience of people who live this every day. Um, so um, I'm curious uh, if I'm on target, if, uh, um, if, you, if everything I tell you today is something you already know or have thought about. Um, it's, uh, you know, I'd actually like to hear that. I'm hoping that's not the case. I hope there'll be some stuff here that will be new regardless. Um, uh, and um, at the end, I'm going to lay out a question for you that I'm interested in asking whether you have some interest in. So 
My proposition for today is that every publisher, um, really every business on the web, should have a set of key performance indicators um, in, for their web usage and traffic that they track consistently and regularly, that they have a spreadsheet where they put this information in, some kind of a tool that they look at on some regular interval, whether it's weekly or monthly or quarterly. Um, uh, that if you want uh, these KPIs to be uh, to um, cause behavior change or cause the people who work in your company to do the right things in terms of building audience online, well, then you should be sharing this data with, within the organization. Um, uh, that they could be, that maybe should be factored into, person, factored into personnel decisions like um, who gets hired or promoted, um, who gets bonuses, or who gets uh, um, uh, the right, you know, the jobs that um, where their job is to build audience on the web. Um, and I would also say that KPIs, and this is this is not me having some brilliant idea. This is this is the literature on KPIs. Is well, you know, that they need to align to the goals of your business. And it's entirely possible that some of your sites have different goals than others. You know, some of you may be. Um, I know this company you're from tourism destinations. My guess is that some of your uh, metrics might be different. Um, because you uh, um, are uh, serving audiences that are outside your market um, uh, than, say, somebody in a uh, suburban community like uh, um, McHenry County, where the North was terrible is. But in, in essence, what I'm trying to try is give you at least some ideas of KPIs that I think are interesting based on the work that we've done. And I want to start sort of here uh, with a data point um, that comes from a Pew report a couple years ago, uh, because I think this is um, telling. Uh, Nielsen Net Ratings, one of the two major um, third-party uh, uh, measurement agencies that exist uh, out there, um, uh, counts 4,600 news and information websites. And they're probably not counting most of yours, because they're mostly talking about sites that extend beyond local markets. But of the 4,600 that they count, um, if you look at the top 300 of those, which is 7% of the total, um, they get 80% of the traffic. Um, and this is actually, this is a slide that I talk to my students about when I uh, do this uh, class on uh, understanding networked um, uh, audiences. Um, uh, what I think the research shows is that in any category of web content, web sites, this pattern is going to exist. Um, whether this is all news and information websites that are measured by Nielsen Net Ratings, or whether it is all local sites in your market, or all sites about um, uh, uh, William Shakespeare, you know, um, uh, there will be X number of sites that cover that topic. And typically, there are a small fraction that get a significantly disproportionate share of the traffic. And it, it's, um, it's actually a little bit counterintuitive if you think about it. Um, uh, you know, the web is. You know, the infinite numbers of pages and sites out there. You would think that our attention would be very widely dispersed over many, many sites in any category we're talking about. But in fact, the evidence suggests that it's more concentrated than it is in traditional media, which is odd. And what the reason for this, I believe, based on this class that we've developed here and the research that I've done and the work I did with our networks expert is that there are these things called network effects. And you've heard the term. Um, uh, but network effects aggregate around phenomena like links and search and social media, and they cause a leader to become a bigger leader over time. You get a little bit of an edge. You attract more links. Um, if you are a blogger who is writing about something in an area that you cover, um, and you're trying to find the story to link to, well, you're more likely to find a story that somebody's already linked to. Um, if you're following um, a set of uh, users on Twitter, um, you will, uh, you know, you, once you've sort of made the decision to follow them, that those will become more influential in your decisions about what you're going to do. And what networks tend to do is to produce what are called power law distributions of what I would say is our attention, our time typically spent. And you end up with the 80-20 rule, which again is a term you've sort of heard about. In general, a small fraction of the total number of nodes in the network get a disproportionate share of the attention. So if I'm sort of, if this is right, then we need to pay a lot of attention to how we use things like links and search and social media um, in order to be the big winner in whatever category we care about. So um, what I'm going to do right now is walk you through a series of metrics that are um, um, obtainable 
um, from Google Analytics and from some of the social media analytics tools that exist. Um, uh, there are so many measurements you potentially could have that it's kind of mind-blowing. Um, but what I've been able to do with the three years of this class is uh, because I can basically say to my students, okay, for the 10 sites we're looking at, go pull this data, let's look at them all. And we can then actually start to see which of these things seem to have some meaning, which of them seem to actually uh, be useful measurements to help us understand how people are using, um, using these sites. Um, and um, in general, I would say, you know, I think um, the kinds of things we want to measure kind of fall into three buckets um, as publishers. One is just size and scale. What's the raw number of people or browsers or users that are coming to our site? Just how many people? The other is some measurement of sort of loyalty or frequency. How often do they come back? Um, how much, um, um, you know, basically, do they, are they flybys? They come in once and they never come back, or do they come back all the time? And then the third is what I'll call engagement, which really has to do with, well, okay, once they do come, what do they do there? Do they spend a lot of time? Do they view a lot of pages? Do they, et cetera? And I think in general, you know, you'd like to have all these things. You'd like to have scale. You'd like to have a lot of people coming to your site. You'd like to have them come back frequently. Um, and you'd like to have them, when they come, spend time, view a lot of pages, see a lot of ads, you know, et cetera. Um, but I think the various metrics that are available, they don't, they all different, they speak to different aspects of this. So um, uh, what I'm going to sort of lay out as a starting point uh, is let's just start with the most basic metrics, which are things, terms that I assume you are at least familiar with. And again, I apologize if I'm getting too rudimentary. There are these things called visits and unique visitors and page views. Um, and, and those are, I think, on some level, measures of size or scale. Um, there are uh, terms like visit duration, pages per visit, um, uh, and uh, mount, uh, uh, that um, have to do with sort of uh, audience engagement. And tools like percentage of new visits, which speak to what percentage of your people are coming for the first time in the period you're measuring. And the question is, which of these things is the most useful? Um, so at the risk, again, of going a little too rudimentary, I want to just, uh, I think it's important to, um, and I, this is what I teach my students, it's like, well, you have these metrics, but you, before you start throwing around whether visits or visitors matter, you better understand how those things are measured. Um, uh, and um, they have, um, they are commonly used. I think actually a lot of people who commonly use them don't fully understand um, how they're measured. So just as a very quick schematic, if I'm a user, I come to the page, I click on the page, um, it will go uh, make a request to a web server somewhere that will deliver um, a page of content. It, it may also go to an ad server that delivers me some ads, and it may also go to Google Analytics, um, which um, uh, is going to deliver me um, a piece of code um, that I can use to measure my site usage. Uh, every single server that delivers a file, whether that is an HTML page or an image or an ad banner or Google Analytics code, can also deliver a cookie uh, to your site, which is a little text file. Um, the text file can be read by the server that delivered it. And the cookie is really important. There's a lot of sort of you know, almost paranoia about cookies, I think. I, I tend to think they're largely benign. But the point is, you have to understand that this cookie transfer from the server to your computer is really at the core of most of these measurements. So that leads us with that context to sort of thinking about some key vocabulary. So um, there is, um, uh, and I'm, he, these are terms you will find if you look them up in Wikipedia or elsewhere. Um, uh, unique visitors um, is usually defined as the total number of unique persons visiting a website at least once in a time period, uh, usually a month. Um, by the way, I'm amused by the fact that we as an industry and um, and I mean, we meaning the internet industry, um, have concluded that the, that the number of people who visit your site once in a month is a relevant piece of data. Um, I, I mean, it, it, one of the things with the unique visitor um, uh, data point that's so problematic is it equates somebody who comes once in a month to someone who comes every day. It's the same, you know, you, each of them is one unique visitor. And so I'm going to make an argument that unique visitors is actually not a terribly useful uh, number for you as publishers, even though it is commonly asked for by advertisers and commonly thrown around as a big number. And I'll give you a little data on that as well. Um, uh, the other thing that's important about um, uh, uh, unique visitors is that it's really not measuring people. 
it's really measuring computers, and truthfully, it's really measuring cookies. Um, uh, so um, uh, every browser you have on your computer, if you maybe regularly use two or three, and I use two or three over time, well, actually each of them has its own cookie. Um, and that means that if I, just me with my three browsers visiting your site, I'm counted as three unique visitors um, uh, in a given time period. Um, uh, then once you've sort of gotten past the idea of unique visitor, well, a visit um, is a continuous series, quote unquote, continuous series of requests for pages from your server. Uh, by convention, the industry has decided that um, if 30 minutes pass between the time I request a page from your, your website um, and, I, and then I come back and get another page, that's counted as two visits. And that's purely an arbitrary decision. There's no magic to 30 minutes. It's just a convention that we've adopted to define when a visit begins and ends. Um, and then there's the number of page views, uh, total number of times a web page is requested by a user. And then there is this thing called the bounce rate. Um, uh, bounce rates are very, um, a lot of the sort of analytics experts focus on bounce rate a lot. Essentially, a, boun a bounce is a one-page page view. So you come to the site, and you don't view another page on that site while you're there. Um, and in direct marketing, um, that's a really bad thing, right? I mean, if you're doing some kind of campaign to bring some someone to your page to sign up for something or buy something, they come to the page and immediately leave, you know, that's not a good thing. On the other hand, um, if I go to a search engine and I'm looking for a particular story on a particular topic, and that's exactly what I'm looking for, and I go to your site and I land and I find that story right away and I read it, I'm not sure that's a bad thing. I mean, it's, it's, a, different, it's a different measure. Yes? Perhaps you'll get to this later, but yeah. what is a, considered to be a good or a bad bounce rate for uh, you know, uh, it's a good question. I will tell you that across the three uh, uh, um, um, classes that I've run this, which I think is now 30-some um, sites that we've looked at, the typical bounce rate for locally focused websites is over 60%, okay? Um, uh, which means that of all visits, 60% are one page view, okay? I don't know what you guys see on your sites. Um, now, I will talk a little bit about the way these things dis distribute, and you'll see sort of why this is. But um, I'm not so sure that the bounce rate number is all that important. But it is, if you were, let's put it this way, if you were tracking it over time, I think you'd like to see it be going down, OK? I'm not sure whether 60% is good or bad. But I think over time, you'd like to see it going down. What you'd like to see is however somebody arrives on a page on your site. And remember, half or more of them typically arrive not through the front door of the front page, but to an article page these days, um, uh, is, that once they get there, you are also, you know there's a reason they got to that page. But you'd also like to seduce them with something else that would cause them to view another page while they're there. And that's obviously not happening. And I think part of the reason, if you look at a lot of websites, is they're not well designed to seduce you with that other thing, whatever it is. Um, you know, you get to that page, you see pretty much the article, you see a bunch of ads. There's not enough other things to make you say, oh, there's actually something else on this page that I might like to look at. And I would say, um, if you were to if you were to measure bounce rate over time and factor in some changes you make to design and how you serve up related content and related links, you might find that you could drive that down. I'm not sure it will get to zero. It will never get to zero. I'm not sure what the floor would be, but I think we'd probably go down. Um, so um, let's talk a little bit about unique visitors for, versus visits for a minute. Um, uh, remember that uh, unique visitors. Uh, what's really being counted are cookies, not browsers or users. A visit happens any time the server delivers a new cookie or reads a cookie that has previously been delivered to your computer. Um, unique visitors are counted each time that cookie is viewed or uh, uh, delivered or read by the server. And a new visitor, we have new and returning visitor, a new visitor is a computer or browser that has not been seen before by the server in a given time period, typically a month, but you can measure new and returning visitors in a day or a year or whatever you want, but typically a month is, is normal. Um, and what I will argue, at least for today, is of all of these measures, if I want to measure size and scale, I'm gonna, I want to focus on visits rather than unique visitors or page views, and I'll tell you why in a minute. Um, if I want to measure loyalty and frequency of these basic measures, probably the percentage of new visits is the one that I want to focus on. Um, and by the way, a lot of these things are not um, ipso facto um, good or bad, right? I mean, a high percentage of new visitors means you're actually, you could argue, you're doing a pretty good job of reaching uh, potential readers, right? That you, you know, they may come in periodically, and you probably to get them to spend any time on your site, the, 
but you've got to get them to come there the first time, right? So potentially, if you can drive some new visitors to your site, people have not been there in a while, um, you and you do the right things once they get there, they might become more regular. On the other hand, if you have a really high percentage of new visits, probably you're not doing a job of getting people to come back over and over again, which is typically a goal we have as publishers as well. And if we want to measure engagement, I would argue the pages per visit number as opposed to the bounce rate or the visit duration number are the better numbers to look, to look at. And, and I will lay out why that is, but I will, I'm also, when I'm saying this is not just my opinion, it's an opinion informed by looking at 30 sites over a period of time and seeing that, in fact, some of these metrics have more meaning than others or seem to have more meaning than others in understanding how well these sites are doing. So the problems with these other metrics that I'm saying we should probably steer away from. Um, unique visitors, because, as I mentioned earlier, each browser has its own cookies. If I have four browsers on one computer or a work PC and a home PC and a tablet and a smartphone, I'm four unique visitors, right, to your site. Um, and so that number, even though it has become the common currency that we use in measuring online audiences, I would argue is a very not meaningful number. Page views, um, you know, we can drive page views up through a variety of productive enterprises, like getting people to click on another link. But we can also do it, and I will wait for some of your sites to do this, breaking long stories into four pages, mm -hmm. um, putting up slideshows that um, generate a new page view every time someone clicks on a photo. And I would argue that this is relatively easy to manipulate and many of the manipulations people do to drive page views up actually users hate. So I would say I would steer away from page views as a general metric. Yes. Yeah. Any data on that, on readers hating? Um, I, uh, I don't think I have data. I, so no, I don't think I have a data point I can quote to you. But honestly, do you do like it? Do you like it? Right? I mean, if you have reading a long story, do you want to click another click to read the rest of it? Um, you know, do you want to, you know, reload the page every time you want to look at a bunch of photos? You know, I, I yeah, I can understand why it's done, um, but I would say um, the other thing is whether or not it's a good or a bad thing, given that different sites have different ways they do these things and it's so easily manipulated, it's very, it, it's not helpful at all as a point of comparison, right? That's because uh, my site may choose to have all long stories be in one page. Yours may break them up into two or three or four, and you're going to get more page views than I do. Does it mean anything? I don't think it does. Um, maybe it means something for how many ad impressions I deliver, and that might be relevant to me, but it's not helpful in comparing sites to one another. Yes? If you make visitors so if they have more than one browser just on the computer, even, even if it's not open, it's still counted. Well, if, you know, if, if, if Let's say I have um, Chrome and Firefox, right? And I visit your site in a month, once with well, each. Okay. okay? Um, I'm going to generate. I'm going to be two unique visitors to your site okay, during that gotcha. period of time. Okay. okay. Um, and if I then go to my smartphone, I'll be a third. Um, and if, then I, if I then go to my, my iPad, I'll be a fourth. Yeah. Um, and again, all, all this is why I would argue, despite the fact that the industry has adopted unique visitors as a very common, you know, commonly used metric, it's not very helpful. It's more unique devices. It's unique, yeah, unique browser devices is really, it's a combination of sort of browser slash devices is what it amounts to. Um, and the other implication of this, of course, is that over time, this unique visitor number is getting less and less useful um, because we have more and more devices and more and more browsers. Um, so whatever value it might have had when there was one browser on my computer, it has gotten less and less useful over time as we add browsers and devices. Um, page, you know, so uh, bounce rate, as I kind of mentioned a couple times, I think if you're measuring the impact of a direct marketing campaign um, that is designed to get you to a landing page and take some action, bounce rate is a helpful number. Um, uh, I would say comparative bounce rate is not very helpful. I do think if you decide to track it over time, as I said earlier, to have a goal to bring it down, I think is a highly desirable thing. Um, I think in general, if you can get someone to your page for the first time, you have, I don't know, just make this argument. Um, um, We've never had a publishing platform before uh, that, that of, the, of which it, this is true. When someone is looking at a page of content, you actually know they have some interest in it. They had to have some interest in it to get to that page. They had to click on a search engine link, click on a shared link, click on a link off the home page. Somehow or other, they, you know they have some interest in what you're looking at. And I would argue one of your challenges as a publisher is, well, knowing that, what else can I serve them up that might keep them on the site? And we've never had sort of the ability to do that before in, in, um, in traditional media. 
Um, so uh, let me add a couple of other data points to this issue about unique visitors. Um, uh, uh, so this is a, uh, a, a sort of a representation of a common um, uh, web local newspaper property from a report that my, um, my competing institution in Columbia put out a couple years ago. Um, but uh, this is, I think, uh, it's based on a real uh, newspaper. I actually don't know which one it is, but I think it's useful for illustration purposes. This is a real newspaper that if you say, what is your print circulation, it's 90,000. Okay. Damn. You say, what's your daily print readership? Multiply by pass along factor, and you end up with 200,000 um, daily print readers. But that same site of, re of 200,000 readers if you actually count monthly unique visitors, it turns out to be 400 or 500,000. Um, and uh, what many uh, publishers fell into the trap of saying was um, selling this number to advertisers. Hey, look at us. It's bigger than the newspaper. You know, we have more readers online than we do in print. We should, you know, that's, that's something we should be proud of. But it turns out that um, the reason this is true is that. Um, we have a kind of a strange distribution or a, a, a skewed distribution of users. We have maybe two-thirds of our users who come once in a month. They click on some search engine link and they land there and they never come back. We have, you know, another 10 or 12 percent that visit twice in a month. We have another 13 percent that visit three to six times in a month. And then there's like 8 percent of our unique visitors who, you know, come back 10 or more times in a month. Um, and, you know, probably that group is going to matter more to you um, than the group that comes once. And if you sort of look at this even, sort of break it down a little bit further, this kind of pattern is actually another version of the 80-20 rule. What you see is that if you think about um, uh, the fan, we'll call them the fan, and this report calls them the fan, the fan, people will come more than twice in a week. Well, they make up maybe only 4% of your visitors, but over half of your page views. Probably you've seen some version of this in your in your analytics. You've got people who come uh, once or twice a week. They're three percent of your visitors and nine percent of your page views. Um, there's these occasional people come two or three times a month. They're roughly the same amount of uh, visitors and page views. And then you have these this huge amount of flybys. And in the last column, you sort of see well, how many page views a month do these different kinds of users generate? Well, these fans who come more than twice a week, they generate 140 page views in a month. Um, whereas the flybys generate three a month for the typical user. So this is kind of a, kind of a way of sort of thinking about the architecture of, of uh, visits and visitors. And when you add that all up, what it turns out is, well, for this hypothet this typical this 90,000 circulation daily newspaper, what you have is 90,000 um, uh, copies sold, um, 200,000 daily print readers, 450,000 unique visitors, but really those people who visit more than twice in a month, there's only 20,000. Um, and that's not, I mean, it sounds depressing to say there's only 20,000, but these are 20,000 people who come back over and over again to your site and an advertiser would like to reach and they're typically highly engaged or interested in your content. And I think the, the proposition is those people matter a lot more than the ones who are the flybys. Um, so that's sort of the problem with unique visitors as a measure. Let me talk a little bit about the problem with visit duration. Um, uh, you've probably heard, I, I know I did, um, when I was, I, I should tell you that part of the standing I have here is that I was the first online director for the Miami Herald back in the late 90s. Um, and so um, all of this is sort of, uh, all of that experience as well as what I've been doing at Northwestern um, adds up to, you know, a long time thinking about, well, what makes this platform different than the, plat the print platform? Um, and um, uh, one of the things that showed up very early in the data that started to show up was, well, the data after time spent on site or time spent for a visit is really low. Like, what you would see, um, again, probably in your analytics, is you'll see the typical, um, uh, the average time spent for a visit or visit duration is going to be 30 seconds or a minute or a minute and a half at most. And um, that's really, again, really depressing if you say, you know, we're used to spending, you know, 20, uh, someone spending 10 or 15 or 20 minutes with the print newspaper. What are we going to do about somebody spending only 30 seconds on a visit to my website? Well, it, the time spent still is too long. I mean, there's, there's, there's no question. We would like to get people to spend more time on our site. But there's a particular problem with the way visit duration is measured in Google Analytics for, analytics for sure and many other Google Analytics passages. Actually, let me ask this question. 
How many of you use something other than Google Analytics to measure? I'm using Omniture. Omniture. Okay. Mm -hmm. So I actually have been trying to get an answer, and I don't have it yet, whether Omniture has the same issue that I'm about to describe. And if you know, please tell me. Okay. But Google Analytics, because it's free, and actually because it's quite good, um, uh, is, is the sort of, I guess, the standard now, really, for measuring web audiences uh, for most content sites. And there's a big problem with visit duration, um, which is that um, here's how it works. Um, let's say I arrive on the home page at 10 o'clock. And at 10.01, I click to page 2. And uh, at 10.05, I click to page 3. And that's the last page I view on your site. Either I click off to something else, or I just move on you know, to another browser tab, for instance. Um, well, time measured goes like this. Well, between this, the time spent on this site is a minute, right, from 10 to 10.01. The time spent on this site, it, 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 yeah, we'll say, we'll say minute, even though probably that's an artificial example. Most people want to spend five minutes on any page. But let's just say this is an example. Five minutes on page 2. Here's the problem. There's actually no time measured for the last page of your visit. Um, and it's just the nature of the way Google Analytics works and the way it counts. It does not count, it counts zero time for the last page that you visit. Um, now, interesting enough, if you think about the typical patterns of somebody visiting your site, probably, in many cases, the last page people visit is the one they spend the most time with. Right? They're reading. They, they had some purpose in mind. They get to a page. That's the one they actually spend some time reading. Right? Unless they just give up in, in frustration and leave immediately. That's probably the one they spend the most time on on the visit in many cases. And we actually count it as a zero time spent visit. Um, so um, I have really been, you know, I, I, like the, I, I like the idea of measuring how much time do people spend because I can actually start to compare that to how much time they spend with television or with newspapers or whatever else. But I've concluded, at least if you're using Google Analytics, the time spent metric is really problematic, especially f the shorter the visit, the more problematic it is, right? If, if you have a one-page view visit, by definition, it's zero time spent. Um, even if it was exactly what they wanted and they spent five minutes reading it, if they don't go on another page on your site, it's counted as zero time. Um, and so um, I would argue that's one of the reasons why I think pages per visit is a better um, um, uh, metric than um, uh, to track over time than visit duration. By the way, just for your information, um, with browser tabs, it's a little more complicated, but not really. Um, essentially, you know, most of us probably typically use the web now. We have more than one tab open, right? So, um, and you may, in fact, have more than one tab open on the very same site that you're looking at. Um, and the way Google Analytics deals with this is it it just basically says, as long as it's within as long as it's within this 30 minute time window, it does not matter how many for, um, uh, uh, browser tabs I have open on your site. The time spent will be from the first page I open and the time there to the last click on your site. Again, though, the last page generating zero time spent in the Google Analytics data. Um, is that issue of zero time spent on the last page, is that new to you? Or are you all well aware of it? Okay, okay good. So, at least one thing I've got for you. So, uh, so yeah, no, I mean, it's, it's, uh, it's always tricky talking to a new audience. I don't know what you know and where you're coming from. But I, I was actually really surprised at this, because I, I, mean, I wrote some stuff back in the, you know, I don't know, five or six years ago for the Media Management Center at Northwestern about, you know, we should be just horrified that the average user comes to our site and they spend 30 seconds, right? And we should be, and it's not a good, it's not a good thing if we want to build a business around this kind of behavior. But it's not quite as bad as you think, because when you consider that the last page visit, which is often the one you spend the most time with, is literally always counted as zero by the, by the way Google Analytics measures things. Um, so um, that's sort of the high level, you know, visits, visitors, time spent, the, the kind of basic high level metrics. Let's now drill down into some more specific uh, metrics that get at some other things we might like to understand in terms of how people are using our sites. So first, we might like to know where our traffic is coming from because we might be able to manipulate that some way. You know, we might be able to get more traffic if we knew where it was coming from and if we knew where we wanted to put our attention. So um, uh, this graph represents some um, uh, sort of an aggregation of multiple kinds of data. Um, one, a Pew uh, report that came out a couple years ago. Two, actually the work my students have done looking at locally focused websites over the past few years. And um, what this basically gets at is what I call these networked audience development practices, links, search, and social media. Um, and it represents, for different kinds of sites, 
how much of the traffic these days is coming from those network sources, right? So if you are a major news site in a local market, a Chicago Tribune, to name one, um, what you're typically finding right now is somewhere between a third and a half of your traffic, and it's going up because of social media, is coming from search and links and social media. Okay? Uh, if you are a local um, uh, traditional media site, say a local, say a Daily Herald or a, um, uh, a community newspaper as opposed to a major local site, um, uh, you're going to be at the 50 or 65 percent um, traffic coming from um, search links and social media. If you are a local online only site, a hyper local site like some of the, you know, you'll be hearing this afternoon from uh, at least one person who's run a uh, uh, startup local website that's not um, focused, not, not tied to a uh, newspaper brand, for instance. Um, and they find that actually between two thirds and 90% of their traffic is coming from search links and social media. Um, so what this represents is actually, I need to actually understand where this traffic's coming from. And increasingly, I need to be aware that a lot of the traffic is not someone who every day checks my website. You know, they're coming in from a lot of different sources. So one of the standard reports you can pull from any of the analytics tools you might use is, okay, well, where is my traffic coming from? Where are my referrals? And typically, um, you'll see a fraction that comes from search. This is from a site in Chicago that I don't need to name, but it, you know, you, yeah, this is the uh, when you go to traffic sources. By the way, uh, this little representation that I'm um, putting on almost every slide from here is how do you find this um, piece of data within Google Analytics? Okay. So if you want to just get the overview of where the traffic comes from, you go into Google Analytics, go to Traffic Sources Overview, you will see this on that page when you get there. Um, and it will tell you what percent of the traffic comes from search, what comes from referral, which means people clicking on links on other sites, and what comes from direct, which is um, uh, people who type the URL in or bookmark it and come back that way. Uh, and then some sites also be, you know, have what Google Analytics, calls, Google Analytics calls campaigns which basically means I get a special piece of Google Analytics code that I attach to some initiative that I'm trying to use to build traffic. A very common one is an email newsletter. You attach a particular type, particular piece of your Google Analytics code to your email newsletter and I can say how much of my traffic is now coming from clicks on that email newsletter. And this particular site that I pulled this from actually gets 10% of its traffic from that email newsletter, which is actually pretty good, I think. Um, even better is that this site actually had the foresight to put that code on the newsletter so they can track whether it's driving traffic or not. Um, many sites I find, we found, actually have email newsletters but don't put the special campaign's code on it so you can't actually know whether it's driving traffic and that's not so good. Um, well, in this site, this is just an example, it's 10%. Um, but, you know, uh, that's actually, I think, one of the things that, um, uh, that I would argue since by definition, right, um, uh, all of these ways that people arrive at your site add up to 100%, right? Um, uh, if you want to think about where to prioritize your efforts, start with the one that's lowest, right? Um, so um, of the three biggies, right, which are uh, search, referral, and direct, the, for this particular site, the issue is the referral traffic, um, which means people clicking on links on other sites. Well, maybe I should be thinking about um, link sharing efforts with other sites in that case. Get them to link more to me. How can I do that? There might be some strategies I can think about. Whereas if, say, my, my uh, direct traffic was really low, well, then I need to get engage in initiatives that will cause people to come back, you know, bookmark my site, or to remember the URL, or to do something to get them to come back more often. So the, the idea is every site's going to have a different relationship among these different sources, um, and you might have to decide which of these kinds of traffic matters more. Most of us, direct traffic matters the most. Um, it's also the hardest one to cause to happen, um, I think. Yes? How much would you say search traffic is skewed by people just typing in the name of it? Because that's, that's really direct. Good question. Uh, that's my next slide. Um, so um, I would argue that, again, I'm, I'm, I want to be careful and say I don't know necessarily that I can recommend to you what your site should do or whether your site is good or bad, okay? Um, I have a little bit of a glimpse of that from looking at the sites we've looked at over three years. Um, at the same time, what I would say is what's more important than whether yours compares well or poorly is do I track this regularly and do I try to move the needle in the ways that matter, right? Um, and so uh, I, you have raised exactly the right question, which is um, that uh, direct, that, that search traffic, a significant fraction of it is people who type in the name of the site or 
in some cases, even the whole URL into the search window in Google, right? Um, and um, if, if you keep that in as counted as search traffic, it's really probably, it probably are treating it wrong. Um, so there's a concept that another, other folks have come up with to say, let's think about what they call branded visits. And branded visits are people who are direct, they type in the URL or they bookmark, plus the people who know enough about the site existing to type the site name into the, into the search window. So in this example, which is coming from Gaper's Block, which is a type of local site here in Chicago, um, you know, typically what you'll find is, um, in terms of sources, and here's, by the way, how you get to this, traffic sources, sources, search over, uh, search over keyword. Um, you know, the number one um, uh, source of traffic is, it says here, not provided, but that's basically direct. People have typed that in. Two, three, and four um, are, in fact, people who typed in the name of the site um, into, into, into a search engine. So I would argue that's more like a direct visit than a search visit. And I would take that, if I were to make keeping track of this over time, I would take it out of the search bucket and put it into the direct bucket. That would be the argument. Um, uh, obviously, another big issue, bigger and bigger every day, is social business, social media. To what extent are, is social media referring traffic to your site? Um, and it's very easy in, um, uh, in uh, Google Analytics to actually look at the percentage of referral visits or all visits that are driven by a variety of social media sources. Obviously, the two big ones that we hear about the most are Facebook and Twitter, but there's others out there, StumbleUpon, Blogger, Tumblr, et cetera. And over time, you know, I know we all think that Facebook's a fact of life, but there were lots of social networks before Facebook, and they all were um, subsumed or outdone by somebody. And I, the history suggests that will happen to Facebook, too. We'll see. Uh, but the bottom line is, you might want to actually measure on a regular basis. In this case, we had this site had 110,000 visits in the time period we're looking at of which 10,000 were visits by social referral. So almost 10% of their visits are coming from um, uh, social media, um, and most of it from Facebook and Twitter. Um, and that's a metric I would definitely keep track of, and I think most sites are now seeing that number going up. And that's also something you have some control over. You have to be able to build it by being smarter about your social media strategy. Um, another way to frame this data is sort of, okay, well, there's lots of ways people are referred to my site, ways people click from search, et cetera. Which of them actually give me the most engaged visitors, right? Um, I might prefer to emphasize, I mean, I might like to know that, right? Um, so within Google Analytics, you can go to traffic sources, sources all traffic, and it will give you in order the uh, sources of traffic of all kinds, whether it's um, um, uh, all referral traffic, it's not, it leaves out the direct traffic. No, no, it doesn't, it's just all there too. So, so in this case, what what you're seeing here is, for this site, um, the uh, uh, rank in order, the number of visits, the number one source of visits is Google. The number two source is, uh, source is direct. The number three source is, a, um, is a, a, a tool called Deliverit, which is actually a vehicle for posting directly to Twitter. So it's really Twitter traffic. Number four is Facebook. Number five is uh, the Twitter um, URL shortener. Um, actually, Gamer's Block, as you see, is referring to itself in some cases. Um, but what you'll see is that, in fact, the level of engagement of visitors coming from different sources is different. On average, the typical, uh, uh, the average visit is 1.5 pages, right? But you can see that a direct visitor goes over that, and a Twitter referral goes under that. Say pages per visit for referrals from Facebook is not as good as your level from direct. In this case, the site it is. Um, it's actually Gaper's Block, which I mentioned, and there is sort of a web native site that does use social media quite well. And in fact, they get even more engagement from Facebook users in terms of pages to visit than they do from people who just go direct, which, I mean, I think that's a good sign. I think it means that you're, they're, they're building loyalty through their social media channels. You will look at a lot of other sites where there's a significant gap between the people who come through social media and the people who come direct. Um, and I would argue that at least you should look at the possibility that the reason is, you know what, we're not really doing a very job engaging our users through social media. We are not communicating in the way they want to be communicated with. We are not giving them reasons to click. We are not um, building, you know, maybe we're just doing an auto feed of our headlines out through Twitter instead of actually engaging with people. Um, and those are, those kinds of practices tend to correlate to less engagement from the social media visitors. Another area that I think is worth looking at is, you know, is looking at the proportion of visits that start on the home page and what's the engagement level of the people who start on the home page, right? Because probably someone who starts on the home page 
is somebody who's familiar with your site, right? They, they at least have heard of it. Um, uh, they, uh, or they were looking for, say, something that you have optimized uh, some, you know, say I'm looking for Jackson Hole tourism information or Jackson Hole news, right? Um, you'd like to be the number one search result in Google for that. And at the point they land on your homepage after doing that, you would like them to spend some more time than just visit the homepage, right? Um, so, um, excuse me, let me turn off the uh, little warning with my, uh, that is off. I know my turn is off very much. Um, so um, I would argue that a visitor arriving on the homepage ought to view more pages and not bounce. Um, and so what you can see, in fact, in this example that I pulled, is that in fact, the average pages per visit for all visitors to the site is about 1.5. But yes, in fact, the people who come to the homepage, it's 1.9 pages per visit. And the bounce rate is lower. And that's good. You would, you know, I think that's it's predictable to some extent, but it's also good. Uh, because there's a reason somebody came to that homepage and you would expect them to be looking for something else on the site. Again, though, what I would say is whether a number is good or bad, the goal would be, this is a metric you might like to track on a regular basis. And if it starts to go the wrong way, maybe you need to think about what your, how your homepage is designed or how your content is presented on the homepage. I can tell you that the sites that um, have done the best job at growing audience over the past five years, and I'll use Huffington Post as an example, one that has done that on a very a large scale, they are constantly looking at their homepage to see what is causing clicks to go inside the site and what isn't. And if there's a headline on that homepage that is not driving clicks, they take it off or move it down or rewrite the headline. Um, and they're constantly looking at that. And that's, I mean, I guess we can say it's a luxury. Maybe your sites can't afford that, devote someone to spend time on that. But the point is, that's an important metric. You get someone to your homepage, you want them to spend more pages rather than fewer. And you'd like that number to be going up over time, not down. Um, another metric to look at also extractable from Google Analytics in the audience mobile overview, and this is a relatively new feature in Google Analytics, is um, sort of the engagement levels from mobile users versus computer users. Um, so uh, this is an example of what you see there is that it starts by just giving you, is this person a mobile user? No, which basically means they're coming from a computer, a desktop or a laptop. Yes, at, the, at this level it is phones, tablets, okay? Um, and what you can see is, as again, probably not entirely surprising, the pages per visit for computer users for this site is 1.58. The pages per visit for um, the mobile users is 1.29. Presumably that means that most of their um, mobile users are using a small screen in the middle of their day, and no, they're not gonna spend a lot of time exploring a lot of pages. We're starting to see some indication, and some of you have probably seen this as well, tablet users have some different patterns of behavior. They actually tend to look a little more like um, uh, computer users because they are sitting back and they're not standing online when they're looking at your site. Um, uh, and in fact, once you get to this page, you can drill down to specific devices, uh, not just phones versus tablets, but iPhones versus uh, Samsung phones. You know? And you can see, the reason I bring this up as a relevant point is if that gap is too large, one thing you ought to be looking at is what's my site look like on a mobile device? Um, as you probably know, there's um, uh, a uh, type of web design that is becoming increasingly common called responsive design, which basically amounts to building one HTML code that will look reasonably good on both a big screen and a small screen. And you definitely see that if your site does that, you will get that gap will narrow. Um, there's nothing worse than on a small screen looking at a full-scale website and having to zoom or scroll to get to the content. If you use a responsive design for your site, it will look presentable, people will be able to access the content, and that gap should be small, blur, um, over time. And as you also see the tablet, again, I'd argue a metric for that. That same metric for tablets ought to be closer to what you'd expect from a computer or even higher, because the tablet user has is using the site more like uh, a desktop user, or even a print user, because it's sitting back in a comfortable chair looking at the tablet, for instance. Um, okay, so that's the Google Analytics stuff, um, and I'm more or less on time, which is good. Um, um, uh, I want to now sort of move on to social media. Um, uh, what we're seeing, as I showed you earlier, is that the analytics tools for websites like Google Analytics are increasingly giving you some measures of social um, metrics as well. But 
within every social, uh, if there's been one area that has just mushroomed in the past three years since I started doing this class, it is the enormous amount of data that is now available about social media usage. And it's available both from the services themselves, like Facebook and Twitter. It's available from a variety of third-party measurement services as well. Um, and um, I'm going to just talk a little bit about Facebook insights and a couple of the Twitter metrics that might matter to you. Um, uh, no doubt you have a Facebook page, and no doubt you have seen on that page that there is a Facebook insights area. You may even have clicked through to it and looked at a variety of information. This, what you will see on that page um, is some measures over time of things they call weekly total reach and people talking about this and indications when you posted something. And then beneath that is a list of particular Facebook posts and each of the metrics associated with each of those posts. Um, uh, what is um, interesting is that I think probably many people don't really know what total reach and people talking about this means. So I'll try to explain that if you would like. The second thing is that there's this button in the upper right called export data which will dump out this spreadsheet with, I think, 80,000 data points on it. <laughs> and um, uh, uh, literally 80,000 columns of data for any site. Um, uh, and um, uh, the question might arise, well, which of these 80,000 data points actually matters? Um, uh, so let me throw out, let me try to sort of answer that a little bit in um, focusing on the data points. One is, just some definitions, total reach by Facebook Insights definition is the people who have quote unquote seen any content associated with your page, which is typically a post you've made to your Facebook page that is either um, because they've liked you, they see it in their newsfeed, or because somebody who has liked you shares it with other people who have not already liked you, it shows up in their newsfeed. I think I use the word, the air quotes around seen because I don't. Just because I look at the newsfeed, even at the moment when that thing is there, does not mean I've really seen it. Okay, um, uh, but uh, it is a metric that Facebook will calculate. It, I would think of it as the potential number of people who've seen it, as opposed to the actual number of people who've seen it. Um, uh, but then there is this other metric which is called people talking about this, um, and the way Facebook measures that is basically first off they have another air quote term, which is people have created a story about your content. When Facebook says created a story, it means they've liked it, which is sort of the lowest threshold of interaction. I like it. Um, they've commented on it, which is maybe the next level of engagement. I've thought enough of this to uh, say something about it. Or I've shared it. I actually think it's so interesting, I want to share it with my friends, right? Um, any of those things count as a story, as do answering a question you asked, which is a kind of comment, obviously. Or maybe you've invited them to an event and they have um, um, said, yes, I'll go to that event. Or that even, no, or maybe I will go to that event. At least all of that counts as a story in the way Facebook looks at things. And all of this leads up to, um, oh, excuse me. Then there are what Facebook calls engaged users, which are people who have actually clicked on your post to go to your whatever it is you're sharing, right? Which is, in your case, typically a news article of some kind or article on your site. And then there is this measure that, that, that um, Facebook calls a virality, which is the number of people talking about this divided by that uh, total daily reach, which is the number of people who could have seen it. And actually, the virality number is pretty interesting. I think you know if you can say um, of you know what what percent, it's interesting both on a micro level because you will find that the virality number is varies widely depending on what it is you're sharing. <laughs> Right? And if you can start to detect some trends in which things get more viral, which means people are more likely to share it, well, maybe I want to do more of those things. Typically, for instance, we find that virality is higher if it has a photo attached to it. I don't know exactly why that is, but it seems to be. And probably if you look at your analytics, you'll probably find that too. If it has a photo attached to it, the virality will be higher. Um, well, maybe you want to make sure that you post photos with your posts if you see that kind of thing. So those are kind of the, the raw basic metrics. Um, uh, what I would say, um, if you were tracking your KPIs for Facebook, I would look at these metrics. I would look, number one, at likes, right? And I think you'd like to have that number be growing over time. So you could measure that in percentage growth, you could measure it in whatever. You certainly don't want people, uh, that number to drop, 
Um, it means that, you know what, I'm actually tired of getting these things in my news feed. Um, I'm going to not uh, remove my light. So you want that number at least to stay stable and probably go up. Um, I also think it's interesting, especially if you were going to compare yourself to other sites in your company or others, maybe you were running more than one site, you know, and you want to do that. Um, you might like to have some kind of way of figuring out um, what's a good number of likes, what's a high number of likes. And I, I, we've actually played around in our class with saying, okay, well, let's, let's calculate a number of likes and then divide it by the number of visits that site gets. So it will give me sort of a, um, some sort of a um, fraction of the gross tonnage of traffic that actually thinks enough of you to have liked your page. Um, so I'm not, you know, I haven't actually seen anybody quote this number, but if I were, say, a company that ran multiple local sites, I would definitely want to track something like that across all of them. Because it may tell me that, in fact, this site over here is doing a better job of cultivating likes. One of the interesting things about social media is, you know what, if you want to like, the most important thing to do is actually ask people to like your page. Um, if you want someone to retweet your content, it turns out that actually asking them to retweet you can't do it, obviously, with every tweet. You know, go crazy. You know, they'll turn you off at some point. But if you really think it's worth retweeting, it should, the data shows quite consistently is that asking for the retweet will cause people to retweet it. Asking for the like will cause people to like it more than not asking. So um, again, you might, that's not. You, know, you can probably overuse any of these things, but you, you know, over time, you can actually um, try to affect these likes over time. And then I would say. Um, Within those 80,000 columns of data that you can download from uh, Facebook Analytics, um, there are a variety of ways they slice it, you know, um, typically over different time periods. You can uh, calculate um, uh, engaged users, people talking about this, and virality by the day, by the week, by the, quote, not really the month. They, their standard measure is a 28-day for a week. That's what their definition of a month, more or less, is. But I would say if I were tracking on a regular basis, I would say, let's take the 28-day numbers for engaged users, people talking about this, and virality. And again, you'd probably like those numbers to be going up. And if they're not going up, you should be examining what you're doing with your Facebook strategy and seeing if there's something that we can do to affect it. And that's another nice thing about tracking things, and maybe one of the most nice things about tracking things over time is you can experiment. You know, uh, maybe in fact, uh, every uh, fifth post I should ask you to like my like my, like my page, you know, maybe that will, or, or a page that I think is likely to be viral that will be shared with other people, I should say, you know, suggest you like this page. Uh, but we can try that and see if it works. And as you can see within, um, within the, uh, the analytics interface, um, you can actually see every single individual post that you've put in, and you can see um, the engaged users talking about this and virality number for each one. And um, you can both eyeball them and say, oh, this one that got you know, 2.3% virality, well, what was better about that than the one that got zero? Well, maybe we'll be able to draw some conclusions. So that's Facebook. I will talk about Twitter a little bit. Um, uh, I would, um, at this point, the state of Twitter analytics from Twitter is far below what you can get from Facebook. Twitter, however, is moving in the same direction. Um, they want to give page owner, or Twitter account owners more analytics themselves. But even without sophisticated analytics, there are some, I'd say, some things worth looking at. One is obviously, as with Facebook likes, the raw number of followers your account gets. And again, you'd probably like that to be going up over time. It would be a warning sign if it started going down, because it means people are tired of hearing from you on Twitter. Um, uh, so you'd like to see those, you know, like to have a raw number, you'd like to see the growth over time. And again, you might also like to have, if you're comparing multiple sites within, say, your company, um, to do some kind of measure that gets at followers as a proportion of scale. So I'll argue followers per 1,000 visits might be a, um, a good metric um, to track over time. Um, and one of the values of that, even with, even if you the only have one site that you're paying attention to, um, is, uh, you know, your business may be going up. Are your followers going up? If they're not, that may be a, an area to focus on. How am I going to actually keep my followers growing while my traffic goes up? Um, and you could also uh, measure a retweets per month number, um, which I think might be an interesting number because that speaks to, again, sort of the virality of the Twitter things that you're posting. Finally, um, uh, within Twitter especially, um, oh, excuse me, so um, a couple of, uh, one other point about Twitter. Um, 
some people I, I respect have suggested that it's a, a, another interesting data point is what is your ratio between followers and following? Okay. Um, so if you have a, and, and I've actually pulled a couple of examples. Here's uh, Evanston Now, which is a hyperlocal site in Evanston where Northwestern is. It has 1,500 followers, but it is only following 85 accounts. Okay. I'm not going to say either of these things are good, is good or bad, but you, if that is, a, if you have a ratio that's that high, which is you know, 18 to one or something. Um, what it's telling you is this site is using. There are lots of people listening to you, but you're not doing much listening to others, right? Uh, you are probably using Twitter mostly for distribution as opposed to conversation and engagement. Okay, and maybe that's a perfectly reasonable thing for you to do, um, but it is a very different strategy than say this other hyperlocal site in Princeton, New Jersey, where um, they have almost as many, they, they, they have almost as many uh, accounts they are following as accounts they, that are following them. And what that tells you is they're actually using Twitter as a listing post um, to what people are talking about on Twitter in their community. Um, again, I'm not going to argue whether either of these things is good or bad. It just, by looking at this ratio, you actually understand something about how these two sites are using Twitter differently. Um, and you might say, oh, you know what, maybe I should be trying to, you know, maybe Evanston Now ought to be following more people because if I were listening to more people, more of what people were talking about in Evanston, I might actually get more news tips. I might actually have more opportunity to get engaged with them. It might actually build relationships that would matter to me over time. And maybe, you know, Planet Princeton ought to be, you know, maybe they, you know, in this case, they have pretty healthy follower numbers, but maybe if that ratio is, is the other way, I need to focus on getting more people to follow me, which means, I need to do a better job with what I post to Twitter. I need to, you know, not just do the automated feed of headlines. I need to, you know, engage with people better. Rich, how do you get to the Twitter analytics? Uh, right now, at the, as far as, basically, all the analytics that I'm giving you right now are basically things that are just on the home page. Um, I actually have not looked recently, because I actually don't have a commercial Twitter account. Um, uh, maybe some of you do. Uh, but the commercial Twitter accounts, which I think they're going to start to maybe even try to charge for this service, they're going to give you deeper analytics. Okay. Um, I don't know if any of you have gone deeper. At this point, all I'm saying is, let's just take the gross numbers, which are the things that you can get just by going to the homepage of any account, which is number of tweets, following, followers. And retweets gets up there too? Um, not through Twitter, but here's where things get interesting, which is there are this huge number of third-party services that um, so Twitter counter will give you retweets in a month. Okay? And I, I've tried not to focus too much on these different Twitter analytic services because they are being invented every day and they are going in and out of business. And they typically start by being free and letting everybody have access to Twitter analytics for any account. And then they typically go to a model where they want to charge, a freemium model where they want to charge you for deeper things. And or you can only you can you can only look at the account you can only see the analytics if it is your account you can't see what other sites can use so I've tended to steer away from those in my class because I can't get access to them um, but there are these services that I'm sure many of you are familiar with um, and again there are more and more of them um, uh, two years ago it was just clout but what uh, now there is also tweet level now there is peer index there are many many others. Um, uh, I think fundamentally they all work largely the same way. Um, they are tracking your Twitter activity. They are tracking your retweets. They are tracking who follows you. They are tracking the activity. And they come up with a score <laughs> um, uh, um, that they adds this all up that purports to measure sort of how influential your account is on Twitter. Um, and while they each use slightly different approaches and algorithms, and they're pretty opaque as to exactly what those tools are. What you will typically find is if you score relatively, they, they all are on a 100 point scale. Um, and if you score well on cloud, you'll score well on tweet uh, peer index, and you'll score well on tweet level. Um, I would say that if I were focusing on my Twitter activity over time, I would say I'd like that number to keep going up, or at least remain stable. Because um, it reflects both how much activity, you, it, it, how, you know, volume counts, right? I mean, if you don't tweet at all, you, these scores will start to go down. But what they also tend to measure is, well, what happens after you tweet? Do people click? Do people favorite? Do people refer? Um, uh, retweet it. Um, and um, uh, a Twitter counter is another one which I didn't mention here, which is really more of a uh, gross analytics. It will count up your number of retweets in a month. We'll do that kind of stuff. So I didn't mention that slide. But 
I mean, Twitter counter could go, Twitter counter could go out of business tomorrow, and there'd be something else that would replace it. There's just you know what has one of the things that has really fueled the rise of Twitter is that this they they have been very open up until now in sharing access to the data so that these other companies can build tools on top of it. What's increasingly happening is that Twitter is starting to ratchet down on those things or get caught to pay for access to that so that because cloud's going to make a business out of these scores. But I would say for your purposes, at this point, all three of these things are free to evaluate for your own site. You can get a score. Um, they largely work the same way. And yes, over time, I would track these. I would pick one or two of them and I would track them because, you have, again, you want it to go the right way rather than the wrong way. 